Pan Pan Psychast. Part three: Modern Stoicism. Knowing me, knowing Andrew, aha! There is nothing he can do. Knowing me, knowing Andrew. So welcome to Andrew's personality quiz. Andrew, are you ready? Taking the stoic approach here, Jack, and ignoring your jibes and your your mockery. I'm ignoring stoicism. I'm I'm totally invested in this. <laughs> I didn't prepare a quiz. I thought Andrew would just cynically shrug it off. So apologies. Uh, I didn't think Andrew would bite. Um, so we're going to look at some modern Stoicism. We've looked at the ancients. Why is it relevant? You know, In 21st century life, we're looking at some different scholars and how they approach Stoicism. What they've thrown out and the baby they've saved from the bathwater on the way out the window. Um, for this... <laughs> I've looked at wow. <laughs> uh, Massimo Puglucci's uh, book, How to Be a Stoic, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Living. We've referenced Bill Irvine's A Guide to the Good Life, which is fantastic. That's something as well. I've also dipped my toe into the world of psychology. I'll get into that later. Ooh. But Andrew, you've done a lot of psychology for this, haven't you? Why what, Modern Stoicism, what's the framework for you? Well, first of all, I'd probably say that if you don't believe that Zeus created us and instilled us with a reason then why are you you're listening? in luck <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> clock out now because i'm about to just go on an hour long you say this dedication podcast is for you <laughs> if hail. you don't believe in zeus then you'll love this <laughs> yeah. thor yeah. thor was more my cup of tea but yeah. go on um so yeah if you weren't uh thrilled with the reason for why epictetus would say like we should follow our reason i don't think you really need the zeus bit for this all to make sense um in fact actually when i was reading epictetus because i wasn't coming from the position of like a believer in god per se uh, i still felt most of it, the things he said were relevant so i don't think mm. you even need to to back it up with science but uh, people still want to hear that so what you know does the science back this up Ooh, good question. And I think it's worth saying as well, I think that in preparation for this episode, I was quite surprised because as soon as I found out we were doing Stoicism, I was just, uh, I just started noticing it everywhere, like yeah. books about Stoicism, like it seems quite like of the time, like I don't know if it's, if that's something that we're going to touch on maybe a little bit later, but I think it is worth saying that there's definitely a, you've got your old school, I guess, more classical Stoic thought. Mm. And I guess in this episode, we're going to talk about a more kind of modern Stoic thought. Um, including some of the science and modern psychology and stuff like that. Well, on that, I think you are right that I started finding it in day-to-day -day life as well. But it's interesting in the books, Bill Irvine's book, he says, prepare to be mocked. Like, don't tell, you should be a secret or a stealth stoic. You shouldn't go around announcing it to the world. Be be people will likely make fun of you, say, Epictetus and Irvine. But you're right, I, I found people in conversations saying stoic things. I think it's trickled down into the public consciousness. But our question for this section, for to build before the advice and practical advice for the everyday person is why is it still relevant because i i doubt anyone listening to this thinks zeus it's like telling people that santa claus doesn't exist isn't it that's like zeus is not the the there's, there's many gods not just zeus as well yeah there's the whole pantheon of gods so we're um, saying none of the pantheon of gods exist sadly no uh well actually no i'm not going to make any claims on that i'm just going to say <laughs> you're going to find out agnostic the to the uh to the greek pantheon as well as all the other gods um 21st century yeah, so, evolutionary biology mm, is sure so it like ultimately because if you if you want to understand human nature away from god created and instilled with god's reason um then you have to approach it from evolution right that, mm. that's that's kind of the key to understanding what it is to be human and of course we could go on a whole bunch of different points here but we'll try and keep it as simple as possible evolution through you know four plus billion years on a life on earth has uh got one imperative really which is survival uh through the process of natural selection so uh traits that have been conducive to survival have survived by like obviously multiplying and passing them down this will happen through sort of random mutations which have then been successful the mutations that weren't weren't and uh and therefore they died off um what does that mean well it means that all animals on uh, in life right now have certain traits that are adapted to their environment that help mm. their survival and for human beings um our natural environment as it were at least for like as homo sapiens comes from sort of uh like so well i guess sub-saharan africa right yeah uh and surviving out on the plains so away from necessarily like like living in the trees uh as we like, uh, like ape ancestry um 
And in this case, you know, what sort of things were important to survival? Mm. And a lot of things had to do with uh, working in groups because human beings, while useful on their own, are very poor at surviving certain things. So being belonging to a group and the and the social cues that like we have picked up over the like m- millennium is hugely important to our well-being right like being feeling valued amongst your peers was essential to your survival so that comes with a whole bunch of things that might cause people stress and anxiety in the modern world today so that's an important thing worth mentioning even just your things like your desire for sex so like lust is a, is a, a going to be a big issue that might concern the stoics as well right the base things are like your human survival right so like the fact that you need food and water to live and that you need to have certain like levels of shelter um, because our bodies have obviously evolved to feel pleasure and pain as a way of encouraging us to do certain things so the things that like let's say like with fruit for instance like we have evolved to feel like a pleasurable sensation to things that are sweet because they're Mm. high in calorie gives us energy to to move on so that's why we crave sugary foods in the modern world this has become a big issue because uh, we are now tempted by this desire for sweet things but we have it in overabundance the stoics again i think this is where stoicism really comes into its in its stride because it says you know you don't need what your mind is telling you to need because Mm. it's there all the time uh, and you need to have temperance yeah i think this is worth mentioning that you know evolution is has one goal and that's survival it's not happiness okay evolution's goal is not to make us happy or be you know mentally fulfilled Mm -hmm. because if we were mentally fulfilled and happy we probably would be less concerned about our survival right so you know our our biology is screaming at us all the time to do these certain things to you know carry on the uh you know the species and to survive um and the stoic's going to say yeah, we don't necessarily need to listen to those. Yeah, and and on that point, it's really important to note that it wouldn't have made sense for any animal through the process of evolution to to evolve to have a thing where, like, let's say you ate one piece of fruit and it was so satisfying that you then just kind of perched under a tree for the rest of your life thinking, like, eternal bliss from this one piece of food no like it's it's vitally important that you have this sharp sense of pleasure but then it goes away so that you will crave it again Mm. so that your survival uh keeps going and the same thing i can't remember which book it was we mentioned this point about like sex as well right that like it's robert writes if buddhism was true right yeah. yeah so like the like pleasure of an orgasm is supposed to be kind of like massively pleasurable for a short period but if you had like just an orgasm that went on forever you would never have like that that feeling like oh i want to have sex again so it's encouraging you to reproduce Mm. um if you only had sex once and then left it at that you may never reproduce or you may reproduce once which would not be particularly great for the genes surviving right so all of these things now are sort of like i guess using the word programmed is is perhaps a poor analogy but I, i think it's fine so like we're now programmed with a certain set of things of like survival imperatives yeah but survival is something that we weirdly don't have to almost worry about too much these days and because of that it causes us huge levels of stress anxiety or or pain it just living in the modern world so it links into a lot of what we've spoken about in the past take for example last episode with david pierce he called this the hedonic treadmill in the books that we've read for this referred to as hedonic adaptation i think robert wright refers to it as the hedonic treadmill as well that because of evolution will never be fulfilled we will never achieve that everlasting happiness and pleasure and I guess this is where stoicism swoops in and tries to save the day to alleviate ourselves from the chains that evolution shackled us to. Uh, yeah, and I think we we will spend most of this episode, I think, talking about how stoicism might help us. But I've, uh, there's a couple of really interesting things about kind of happiness and mm. our, like I suppose how it works within our genetics. And this is where I think perhaps even in further analysis and discussion, I would I would say for certain types of people, uh, stoicism might be even more useful than it could be for others. Now, right. I, I still think it could be applicable to all human beings, but I think for some, it might be important. Uh, I read, I think it was about half a year ago, I picked up, actually maybe a little bit longer than that, I've, I picked up Jonathan Haidt's, uh, the, like, The Righteous Mind, but also uh, more recently picked up his, uh, The Happiness Hypothesis. Mm. And if you haven't read either of those books, I'd highly recommend both. In fact, actually, uh, Rudger Bregman mentioned The Righteous Mind in his interview with the Panpsychas. The, but I'm talking about The hi- Happiness Hypothesis here. It's a great book on, like, kind of just key points within um, sort of modern psychology particularly Mm -hmm. like the 
sort of positive psychology of how you know how how do we be happy um and and here are a couple of important things as far as the psychology is concerned and it's talking about genetics it says that uh you know like genes have a huge part to play in in sort of like intelligence extroversion fearfulness religiosity political leanings uh and likings and dislikings of certain things that are kind of typically thought of to be down to taste mm -hmm. um or or like influenced by your upbringing but they have strong hereditary factors as well and for our our concerns here it's uh, happiness it says uh this is a quote in fact happiness is one of the most highly heritable aspects of a personality twin studies generally show that from 50% to 80% of all the variants among people in their average level of happiness can be explained by differences in their genes rather than their life experiences mm. and that means that some of us are born more predisposed to be like generally like optimists and like see the bright side of life and all of this stuff some people are predisposed to be slightly more pessimistic and one of the things that you're mentioning there about the like hedonic sort of treadmill or the uh, what, what did you call it sorry the hedonic the, treadmill or the hedonic adaption yeah so um there's like this idea uh, that because of this uh, so our genetics remember this isn't like determinism right like, there is variance in this you're not like doomed to be miserable mm. uh, there are plenty of things so, as we'll talk about that can help you with this however yeah there's this idea that like, when you do certain things you'll kind of revert back to your hedonic set point yeah like there is there is a certain level that you are kind of naturally at mm -hmm. and that that's not like a one point it's like imagine it like a bracket so there are like you know you will still experience some highs and lows mm -hmm. but there is a kind of a typical point that all people stand and i think if you think about your life so far you can probably appreciate that quite a bit mm -hmm. i i can think of times where i was really really happy but then it you do kind of just go back to the set point yeah and that becomes vitally important for the stoic ideas of say like attachment where you know we think if we progress and get all of these outside goals that we're going to like get happier mm -hmm. overall but maybe that's just a trick of the mind it's it's interesting because it's so much overlap to episode 61 and david pierce's solution was that you can never raise this head on accept point unless we do change the hardware so we need to change our biologies maybe through drugs maybe through genetic adaptation and eugenics and it's only then can we experience these long-lasting pleasures and happiness and stoicism I, I guess as a stoic you could also adopt this this transhumanism that we should improve the human condition through technologies to be happy but the everyday stoic can do something about it now in practicing certain techniques to alleviate themselves from the hedonic treadmill so again reading from uh, jonathan hates the happiness hypothesis it talks about uh, the psychologist richard davidson uh, who gives two types of what he calls positive affect uh, so pre-goal attainment and post-goal attainment and he argues that the pre-goal attainment is the thing that gives people the most pleasure so like setting yourself a goal like taking steps in that right direction mm. feeling like you're making progress uh that create some sort of fulfillment uh, but the actual like post-goal attainment the the the, eff the effect that that has on you uh is very limited uh you get like this short burst of dopamine you might feel like satisfied with having obtained your or achieved your goal but that goes away uh somewhat immediately mm. and that's that's vital for what we were saying about that like hedonic set point as well right like you will no matter what you achieve as far as physical goals actually you just don't feel that ha as happy as you think you might and mm -hmm. you, you're like we're so bad at predicting the future that we keep thinking the same thing will work yeah. over think, and over what's again what's next what, yeah, what can yeah. i do to, what, what's next on the list so like if we take someone running a race for example so like all the training and preparation and the running of the race itself would give more pleasure and happiness than actually winning it Mm. Is that kind of what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, there's like next race. There's like, what's next? I'm like, I've, I'm satisfied now. I feel a bit happy for a moment. Um, or, or maybe your point here is that they don't have that that big hit that they thought they would to last them a long time. Um, yeah. Like because... a football manager who wins a game. They're like, what? You know, you must be chuffed. You're top of the league. They go, no, I'm focused on the next game. Mm -hmm. Like, you th oh, it would be brilliant if we beat Manchester United on the weekend. They do it. Like, it feels good for it, not as much as they thought it would. And then it's on to the next thing. Yeah. And even more importantly, let's say if there was a like a, a league where some, somebody was like so far arrested the other teams that mm. like kind of a couple of months before the end of the season, you already knew mathematically that you were going to win. Mm -hmm. Like when you reach that point where you finally have one, 
it doesn't like the expectation was always there and it doesn't feel particularly special even though you've still won right uh, so there is this kind of weird thing that like if you win almost out of surprise you get this bigger spike but that still mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's going to make a huge long-term difference um last point i wanted to make on this what's called the uh, adaptation principle mm -hmm. which is very similar to what we're talking about with the set point right so if you if you get used to a particular uh, yeah. thing you adapt to the way that that was right and then like it becomes the norm in which case like you you will just seek more in the future right or alternatively so i think the example in the book is that you, if you win the lottery yeah that you have maybe a year where you buy a bunch of stuff you feel really great but then you kind of just go back to the way you were always feeling before you mm -hmm. won the lottery uh, and he even mentions because qualities of relationships can often break down when people win the lottery that actually Makes it in the long run most lottery winners typically uh don't feel or it might, might even in fact feel worse having won right um and I read a little bit about this out of curiosity, and I think it's I think it's Sweden, where it's like it's the like one of the only countries where lottery winners are actually overall more fulfilled having won it. Mm. But it's because they invest it in a particular way. So they like they invest it smartly and kind of almost stoically approach their winning the lottery right. and not just splashing it out in this big kind of like oh, I'm going to get everything. Like, that's actually a really bad way. If you ever win the lottery, don't do that. It's patreon.com for us. Yeah, you could give the money to us and we'll have a great time. Because um, we know how to do it properly. But just to jump in on this point, we were speaking about this earlier, weren't we? Perhaps I have like a bad pair of headphones and then I get some studios and the audio quality is average and forever, like, I just get used to them until they break. Or perhaps a better example would be like um, like fizzy drinks. Oh, we were talking... Uh, before this as well about how I might drink, uh, someone might just drink orange juice or a Fanta, but I've got cultivated a like for San Pellegrino orange and I can't have a fizzy drink without having it now. Like everything else just feels not good enough and it doesn't make me happy to have them. It's just something I've become accustomed to mm. or like cafetiere coffee. I just, I need that type. No offense, Ollie, the coffee's great here, but it just, just doesn't, it's not what I'm used to. It's just not stoic enough, Jack. That's your problem. And the, the last point we'll make on this before we start getting into the more like stoic advice uh, from these these kind of perspectives um, mm. is like the opposite. So of course, yeah, if you win the lottery, you might adapt to that way of living and then that won't actually make you any more happy. In fact, you might have to keep investing more and more and more um, and that has its issues. But it also says that if like, let's say you were to become disabled, right. um, particularly what people happen is like, yeah, they feel really bad about it at first. Of course you would. Mm. Um, but then you adapt to your new way of living ah. and then you set like, like sort of reasonable goals for yourself uh, mm -hmm. that would obviously be, be a lot less than you ever would have done when you were were like like fit and not disabled so like being able to even like take your first step will feel massively rewarding um and it mentions uh, stephen hawking as a perfect example here where like when he was being interviewed by the new york times uh, and asked about like how he keeps his spirits up and he says expectations were reduced to zero when i was 21 everything since then has been a bonus so i guess in that sense like if you take that perspective like, and and i guess epictetus had a, a somewhat similar view yeah. that like if you're if if everything is taken away from you that doesn't have to guarantee that you live a miserable existence mm -hmm. and as long as you keep the right, right mind frame uh, then there is something to be said there uh, and it just goes to show then that at least modern findings in psychology have kind of pointing somewhat in that direction there is plenty of things that i wanted to add in like criticisms that we can get to yeah where there are there are arguably quite a lot of external things that we should be concerning ourselves with. But for now, let's uh, stick to advice. So we've so far said, if you're not a big Zeus fan, <laughs> which we know you are really, um, no matter what you say to your friends, um, then okay, so we can take away the God bit and then we can kind of stick in instead this evolutionary psychology point, yeah. which so far, if I've been listening and making my notes, which I haven't <laughs> been doing either. Um, so, okay, so you're, you're telling me that happiness plateaus. That you'll yeah. reach a certain level of happiness, yeah. you'll get happy for a little bit, and then you always come back to that kind of mean happiness. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're going to tell me that um, I want like gratification from things like I want to be famous um, because that's kind of built into my evolutionary psychology in my brain because I want the people around me to trust me and I'm more likely to survive that way. Yeah. Um, I want food because I need that to survive um, and that there's never going to be, because of the way my brain is wired and worked, 
I'm not going to try and find like a long lasting permanent form of happiness in yeah. like virtuous things. I'm more likely to go for the fast food. I'm more likely to go for like the instant gratification because that's just the way my brain works. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's exactly right. And, and it's, it's uh, just like I was going to add the only like more, even more concerning thing about all of that is that like often enough, and I know, I'm not sure if this is strictly scientifically like correct, but like evolutionary speaking we often take like the path of least resistance as well because maybe mm. we want to just conserve energy or something um in which case we not only like kind of want like the fast food and stuff but like once we had a bit of it like we kind of keep going for it and yeah. it's like we indulge in these things because it's so easy um and that leads to a like a very unhealthy long-term lifestyle essentially yeah as you've just correctly pointed out evolution cares about like short-term gains and mm. very rarely considers what what how, like how happy do you want to be when you're 50 like <laughs> evolution doesn't care at all in fact uh, it cares about like while you're young how do i get you to reproduce and that's the key there's the last episode on david pierce if you're interested in these ideas and you haven't went back and listened to it there's literally a good two hours of us debating whether or not uh, this is true and perhaps his solution to it but the stoic solution to it which obviously is our focus here um wife and i picked out some of the advice like the stoic advice column from these modern stoic books and how we can apply it to our lives and the first one i wanted to mention which i think is really interesting is something we mentioned the last one is this idea of negative visualization and this is something that uh, piglucci and irvine both speak about in their books and um, just to quote from uh, irvine here he's talking there's a context is that when natural disasters hit somebody or when you experience the death of a loved one it wakes you up from your slumber um, so before these individuals might have been sleepwalking through life now they are joyous thankfully alive as alive as they have felt in decades i've got a good friend who works out in zimbabwe and people go there to volunteer to help out schools and rebuild the community and he says more times than not they went through a trauma in their lives and it's woken them up and now they want to experience and enjoy the world now they realize just how precious life is uh, a, a brilliant quote from Irvine on this. There will be, already has been, a last time in your life that you brush your teeth, cut your hair, drive a car, mow the lawn, or play hopscotch. There will be a last time you hear the sound of snow falling, watch the moon rise, smell popcorn, feel the warmth of a child falling asleep in your arms, or make love. You will someday eat your last meal, and soon thereafter, you will take your last breath. And he's saying here that you should remind yourself of this regularly. And if you live, and it sounds cliche, live every day as it's your last, or have, like, this would be the last conversation the Copy three of us have. Carpe diem, baby. <laughs> or YOLO, is that... <laughs> <laughs> he's trying to make this more relevant. <laughs> that you and your carpe diem and your jugs. I'm talking about <laughs> iPhones, Fortnite, and YOLO. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably all last year, Jack. <laughs> most out-of-date <laughs> sentence. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the point is that if we try and live every day like it's our last, we won't live like heads and just go crazy and just like sell all our stuff and, and give them to the poor to make sure we get to the pearly gates. What we'll do is like this could be, imagine this was our last conversation the three of us have. All of a sudden that feeling makes you really value just how lucky we are cosmically speaking to end up in this room and have these conversations together. And I think that's a, a really, really powerful way of answering the question. So how can I be happy with what I've got now? Like physically speaking and biologically, like in my brain, how can I be happy with this donut here and overcome my evolutionary or, or Zeus instincts, whichever one you, you favour. Any thoughts you want to unpack on this? I've got a, a funny story. Um, yeah, well, before we, <laughs> before we get to that, um, yeah, like, <laughs> I think well, we might as well come up with some suggestions then of like, okay, so we've now explained why our minds kind of desire these things, but what do we think are kind of the key issues that are very much current modern day issues that prevent us from looking at long-term fulfillment. So like people often talk a lot about like instant gratification. Yeah. Um, and so like what, what are things that we think of that like cause instant gratification that are most accessible in the modern world? I'm not, uh, uh, my thought, and perhaps you need to divert me back across so I'm thinking negative visualization. Are we moving away from that? Because I'm thinking, imagine the the parent who um, who's the the dad in uh, Metamorphosis. <clears throat> Um, what's his name I forget his name the father of metamorphosis yeah, when we yeah, did that yeah. reading he spends his time reading the paper and kind of ignoring his family and taking them for granted and you overcome that gratification of thinking that you've 
your children will live forever and you'll have forever to speak to them and that the paper gives you that short-term gratification or that cup of tea, that coffee, that donut. Those are the things that are important. And to put it into context, you do this. So I think the answer to everything, is is there anything which doesn't give you this instant gratification? So you're saying with negative visualization, the whole point of, it, of this practice, so regularly remind yourself that this thing you're doing right now might be the last time you yeah. do it, the last time you eat this type of food or see this person or talk to this do this thing that will make you treasure and value it more than someone who's just like oh well, i'll just see that person tomorrow or yeah. i'll just eat this in a week's time or something like that what that if i get- mean to you like and if i say like ollie like you haven't had a very good accurate reading of um let's say uh, where the word stoicism came from like you can either like be there and be like even though i got it right you got it wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well i could be offended by that or i could think like actually, this is the last time I'll ever speak to Ollie. And it's like, this is so pointless and meaningless. And the meaningful thing is our friendship. And not that you're wrong about the stoicism point. Because I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you're getting it right. (laughs) Yeah, uh, I think there are plenty of things where we can say, uh, I mean, you know, none of this stuff is groundbreaking, right? Where we're saying like, be, be grateful for for what you have um and i think there is a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that being grateful for what you have is is actually quite key for being fulfilled or being happy Mm. um particularly when it comes to your relationships um because ultimately that's that's typically what provides meaning for most people in this in this world and there is very good reason uh, for that right so um yeah I, stoic advice number one i guess so far is that like particularly with the people in your life right now um we we concern ourselves often so much with our careers or or like hobbies or mm. or anything like distractions uh that you might want to carve out that like extra time for when it's needed um and i know like everyone knows that uh, but there's a difference between knowing it and actually doing yeah. it and uh the stoics as well as plenty of of the like modern like psychologists are arguing that you know that really is what you should be spending mm. your time with so if you are going to distract yourself perhaps do it with other people yeah exactly and i think this is really really powerful just to reflect on it briefly for a moment before we get onto the second piece of advice because like you say everyone knows that they should not take the things that they love for granted so how can i not imagine not having them and and like if you actually reflect on it then it will be a really powerful thing so i was flying to prague and reading this book Um, a couple of days ago and I share this passage with you Uh, consider for example a passenger I was feeling quite anxious on the flight genuinely feeling a bit anxious Uh, just an interview somewhere and uh, on a flight and I was feeling I don't know why it's a few butterflies read some stoicism to calm me down consider for example a passenger on an airliner the engines of which have just burst into flames this turn of events is likely to cause the passenger to reassess his life and as a result he might finally gain some insight into what things in life are truly valuable and what things are not unfortunately moments after this epiphany he might be dead (laughs) so i shut the book for a while (laughs) um but no i think that's a really powerful piece the second point i don't want to reflect too much on this one because we mentioned it last time is self-denial and Mm -hmm. and making sure you don't taking stuff away can make you appreciate them so it's kind of an active vet negative visualization um so quite quote from marcus aurelius otherwise you will be twitching puppet wise at every pull of self-interest grumbling it today or lamenting over tomorrow so we should embrace socially awkward situations we should uh, walk barefoot in the streets or make sure we don't have a delicious San Pellegrino orange and maybe opt for like a, a squash instead someday. And then it will allow you to appreciate things. And then you're not stuck on getting used to the nice things, as you were saying, evolutionary, we, we tend to anyway. Yeah, uh, just connecting to what Andy said earlier. So he said that we take the path of least resistance to whatever we desire. Mm. Right. So whether that's, I think it's easy to use fast food as an example, right? So like food that's like really bad for you in inverted commas, it's got a lot of fat, a lot of salt, a lot of sugar in it, but you really, really want it you can get it in like 10 minutes and then devour it really quickly and it makes you feel good for a brief amount of time as opposed to like a piece of fruit which will give you more energy just over a longer period of time but doesn't give you that initial burst of like energy and, and kind of like dopamine so the stoics are saying or our modern stoics even connected back to epictetus he's kind of saying that actually no you need to practice some form of self-denial mm. um, that even though you may really want the cheeseburger with the extra large fries and the shake um, that actually having that and being attached to that is bad because that in of itself is not a good thing and it's mm. outside of your control right like imagine if all cheeseburgers disappeared tomorrow 
you know, there's nothing you can do about that. And if you're like really, really upset about that, then that's your reaction to it. Um, you don't need a cheeseburger to survive. Now, I guess like food's a bit of a weird one with that because you do need some food to survive, of yeah. course, right? Like, you're going to be daft here. But do we overeat in the Western world? Well, yeah. Yeah, like, the, like the, a the, lot. The UK, uh, I mean, we won't comment on other countries, but like the UK is... <laughs> <laughs> we'll comment on our main missing base <laughs> <laughs> because we'll lose them all. Um Obviously, like we're talking about it, like general statistics here, but in, in the UK, yeah, there is a growing number of like large uh, level of obesity uh, creeping up on us, if not already here. Mm. Um, and and which which actually just goes to show that a lot of the way in which the sort of the modern world is structured is this kind of any way in which you choose to live is equal to any other way, uh, and that you know you do you, and that you you like as long as you're happy, whatever that means, uh, that you should like yeah. you know embrace embrace your life. Uh, but the problem is is that um, as as this like whole episode has been about is that we're often really bad at recognizing what's good for us. Mm. Uh, we're often really bad at preventing our immediate impulses uh from getting the better of us and so like we we literally have like all of this choice uh bombarding it with like advertisement and and flashy colors and and like and just all of the food that's on the high street is often like high fat high sugar and no wonder right like no wonder that people struggle with this and that we have people growing in obesity because we're not providing people with the basis of like how to say no yeah. uh, or that like, or even making it seem like, like I think th we are getting there now, but with like people actually being a little bit more critical of the, like the lifestyles that lead to these things. Well, um, and that there, there shouldn't, you shouldn't necessarily be completely content with just saying like, there's not a problem here. Like, no, I think people can do better for themselves. Mm. I think there's nothing wrong with saying that uh, imposing that directly. And like, and particularly when you're like forcing certain demographics that can be very questionable yeah. um so there is a way to do this and a way not to um but i think there's a lot to be learned we both read the william Irvin book and he talks about the same thing and uh, reflects on a visit to a shopping center and you see people going and buying things for the sake of them trying to yeah. live on the center of the treadmill and he looks at them now and thinks oh i don't need all these things but think how fundamental that is to our capitalist society the need to buy things or or, or seek pleasure all the time it's no surprise that people are doing this if it's founded in our in our biology. Yeah, self denial is seen as kind of weird, right? Like it's not common, I would say. Like you don't get many conversations where people stand around and go like, "Oh, how did you make your life more difficult and harder and less pleasurable today?" Um, it's more the opposite, right? Like, "Oh, I got this new." technology that can do this thing easier i got an amazon echo now i just have to talk at my light and it turns on because i can't be bothered to turn it on myself <laughs> i'm not looking at anyone in particular um no no kind of disrespect to anyone that has that technology but again like you can definitely see that this 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 you know connected back to the stoicism right like epictetus these stoic philosophers are saying like you don't talk about this in public because it's kind of seen people are gonna think you're pretty strange yeah um and i think the modern stoics would kind of agree with that like it is seen as a bit weird yeah yeah, um, on, on that point, you mentioned what Irvine was saying. Uh, he mentions the fact that, yeah, people literally go to the shops not because they have already an impulse to buy anything, but because they almost want to like be walking through the, the shopping center and then be given the impulse. They literally want to be like given an excuse to buy something that yeah. before that day started, they didn't even know they wanted. Think about how weird that is, right? Like, like there's that you, you don't have a desire some, for something, but you want to go to a place that will in, like make you to, des to desire something that you don't need, and then you want to buy that thing. Yeah. Okay. Why don't you wish that you didn't desire that thing, and yeah. therefore succeed in not spending more money than you need? And he says um, that it will take us less time. If you yeah. think it will be like it's time consuming to find that that perfect yeah. wife, that perfect family, that perfect car, the perfect frock or perfect shoes or shirt frock. whatever i'm not sure i'm, I'm really out of touch <laughs> like i things... don't wear clothes <laughs> i saw the police officer at stoicism he told me it was a, a six month jail sentence um but the point being is that well, i've completely lost my train of thought here help me out so <laughs> i'm not sure where you i'm thinking of myself but... naked in front of the police officer now um wait what right, yeah so where are we? You no, said right. trying to find these perfect. Yeah, it takes like less energy. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so it if requires just... less energy to sure. to kind of apply your bit of self denial than it does to try and fulfill all of your short short term desires. Hmm. Um, 
And in that sense, I do kind of buy into that, right? Like, okay, so you might feel it really hard to resist that, like buying that like frock or whatever you might decide to buy. <laughs> but if you just apply like the tiniest bit of self-constraint and walk away, right? Uh, yeah. I think actually weirdly when we were, uh, when we interviewed Ben Nane, um, weird link but it kind of fits here where he said like you know the best way to kind of like to self-deny is actually to like yourself in the situation yeah to like avoid the thing so like he showed us his like old school phone to keep himself on social media yeah so like avoid avoid certain things and actually you won't really miss what you didn't have yeah Uh, and it actually might benefit you quite a lot in the long run And and it requires a lot less effort for you to do that rather than like every Saturday thinking, what am I going to do today? Uh, I don't have anything planned. So I'm going to go to the bull ring and I'm going to walk around until I want something. Nice plug for the bull ring. That's a weird o- thing to do. plug for the bull ring. I mean, literally think about that for a second. Yeah. I don't yeah, have I anything I'm, yeah. I need to do today. So I'm going to go to a building that's going to make me want something and then I'm going to buy it. I, to, to, <laughs> I think, okay. Yeah, I think, I think. I know that's a really yeah. cynical way I to think, look at I think, people. Yeah. Some uh, people do. do yeah, it's not, yeah. I can't relate, but I think there are when you... Not everybody in the ball ring is there to buy no, something specific and yeah. then go home. Yeah. People yeah. go to shop because they want to experience shopping, which, yeah, for me is quite... Uh, it's a hobby, Andy, yeah. I think. Well, I think like, some people do almost see it that way. Uh, coming across really kind of like hoity-toity philosopher <laughs> King. right now. Yeah. So, let's, uh, <laughs> right, so uh, last, point, number, yeah, point number one, uh, right. negative visualization. Well, right, we've so had you, s- remind, you remind yourself of things that, um, that it might be the last time you have this food, the last time you speak yeah. to this person, treasure your relationships with people more. We've point number two, self-denial. self-denial. So don't always go for the easiest convenience, whether it's food or certain situations. Actually, a bit of self-denial can be good for you. Yeah. And if it takes less effort to deny yourself something than to go on a massive hike to find something you may want. So we might be thinking we can engage in these uh, negative visualizations and denying ourselves things. But also there's a big thing about stoic meditation, which we haven't spoke about. Um, And essentially it's creating within ourselves perhaps a stoic observer who watches and comments on our practices as a stoic and judging yourself, that internal judge of whether you're being a good stoic. But also maybe lying in bed at night and thinking about um, how during the day or maybe actually writing a diary how you can be a better stoic in your day-to-day life um, and there's lots of brilliant things there's a I just want to mention uh, Massimo Piglucci's uh, new book which came out last week uh, live like a stoic 52 exercises for cultivating a good life there's also the group modern stoicism they have stoicism today and please a magazine there's heaps of stuff online about stoicism now and meditations but there's also stoic con which is in Athens this year which has about 300 to 400 stoics attending big group of stoics supporting each other etc and um, trying to cultivate good stoic practice but just before we move into some uh, i guess more delicate topics there's a trigger warning on death and, and old age then perhaps we <laughs> so then apparently jack doesn't care for trigger warnings no i do that was the joke we're talking about them off microphone so that's a very in joke um to quote uh Seneca, Every day I reduce the number of my vices and blame my mistakes. And Marcus Aurelius reminds us that um, when we're not being a good stoic and it all seems hopeless, that's when we should really stoic up. So as we mentioned earlier, becoming a stoic sage isn't something which many of them consider to be completely achievable, but we should be striving towards this thing. So meditation is a great way of reflecting on whether or not you're being a good stoic. Should we talk about death? Yeah, I think that would be a nice way to end. That was your segue. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, we'll end this segment in the way that all of our lives will end. Um, So, yeah, old old age um, and and death is like a really important part, I think, for everybody in the modern world to reflect on. Now, Mm. it's worth obviously mentioning that, and this is something that obviously the Stoics would want us all to contemplate as well, is that ultimately none of us like deserve to live into old age. Uh, There are no guarantees. Um, We have returned. Exactly. And so no, we're not saying that like expect to live into old age, but uh, statistically speaking, at least in the in, like in the UK, the uh, the average age for a man is around like I think seventy five plus, and for women it's like eighty three plus or something like that. And I reckon that that age will increase um, as like you know things become like even more accommodating for people. Um, so let's just say right now, if you're like a young person listening to this, you could expect to live into your like eighties, nineties, maybe even over that. Do I count um, as young? I think so. You like no, Jack. <laughs> uh, in which case, 
you should be caring about that period of your life. Yeah. Uh, because if you, assuming that nothing bad happens to you, you will reach that point. Um, and old age comes with a whole list of, of potential issues that the Stoics uh, might be very concerned about. And uh, the, the other thing, which is what I was particularly interested in when reading William Irvine's book is he talks about kind of being exiled to the nursing home. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that is something in which there is going to be some big questions to be asked. Uh, Again, just focusing on our country right now. Um, We have like a growing elderly population. Uh, We have so like less people are having many kids. uh, And because the the average age is increasing, we have like this elderly population, uh, quite a large elderly population, but with less young people to kind of look after them. And so where do these people go? They go to care homes. Mm. And that is like, that's going to be a big issue because like, that needs to be funded. That needs to be like well-respected. And uh, you might find yourself very well being like, like exiled to a home like this in the future. Uh, so you might want to think about what life might be like for you in this place. Just to run parallel to this, that he's also, Irvine also talks about, you know, how people in his classes are in their twenties and certainly reflecting on it when I was reading it, I thought this is true for pretty much all of my students. And particularly I find myself falling into this mindset in your twenties, you, you, you know about death, but you do feel like you can live forever. You hit your 40s and we have this midlife crisis and you might buy a new car. You might have an affair. You might um, you might go on that trip to across the world and, and to go to Zimbabwe and do all these things. But again, you're falling into that hedonic treadmill again. And then you reach your old age and then you start to you recognize that you are going to die. And it's only then do you really... That's why stoicism is considered more of a mature outlook on life is because you don't really have a choice when, you, when you're in your 80s and you're sat in the nursing home. Um, a quote from uh, Seneca, the man who adapts himself to his slender means and makes himself wealthy on a little sum is truly a rich man. And Marcus Aurelius, if you live in a par- palace, you can also live well in a palace. No matter where you are, stoicism gives you the tools to deal with that situation but you're right there's this he also it's like living in the he, Irvine likens it to a plague doesn't he living in like a back to school days in the nursing home but also the ambulance turns up every other week and yeah, someone's course, taken yeah. away it's like living in a crisis yeah and stoicism how apart from recognizing it's out of your control and putting it like being grateful for what you've got is that what stoicism offers the person if you're listening to this in the nursing home what would you say to them i think even before we just jump into the nursing home thing i think yeah just a couple of things i want to kind of mention i think not all elderly people will go to a nursing home i think that's worth saying first yeah of of course but i think that there is a maybe the way we can kind of frame old age here is that nobody really wants to get old i think ultimately right you know i when i talk to my elderly relatives and elderly people like you know they'll be like oh you know i'm like 60 or 70 but i'm still 25 in my head Mm -hmm. um and there's no reason why that won't feel different for anybody else um you know our bodies eventually decay and they get old and we can't do the things that we used to do and sometimes even pride ourselves on uh, pride ourselves on right whether it's being able to be independent being able to walk to the shops and Mm -hmm. back or being able to drive or whatever so i think there's this sense that the body itself becomes a form of prison that you're kind of may mentally still be quite uh, capable and you can talk and converse and you know uh, all those things are fine but your body kind of lets you down Um, And in that sense, it doesn't matter if you're in a care home or if if you're in a a house with your family, it doesn't matter where you are. Um, You know, you you, you are very then much more aware than maybe someone younger of your mortality. Mm. Um, You know, whether you go through that really weird life cycle thing you did. I think some people when they're 20s think about death. I don't think everybody has a midlife crisis when they're 40. Yeah. But I think we all eventually, if if we do reach that age, we get to the point where our bodies start being aches pains illnesses catch up with us and Mm. then we get to the point where our bodies become a form of containment and then what do the stoics then say about whether it's a nursing home or not how do we deal with that i think is is the interesting point it's a perfect analogy between growing old and being epictetus right you lack the freedom you can't literally go around everywhere you're a slave and also your mental faculties and your physical body starts to let you down like he was he was lame for for the significant part of his life and he was able to be free happy and tranquil regardless of his circumstances so i think this really speaks to people who aren't like well it speaks to everybody but in particular it would speak to somebody who finds himself in a really difficult circumstance this is how you can find happiness there yeah particularly because uh i can't remember if it's in this book or not but definitely remember reading somewhere it mentions the fact that as you grow old you also kind of like you don't have these 
massive bouts of like great pleasure anymore mm. like the, the satisfaction you get is not as quite as intensified uh, as when you were young and so maybe looking at stoic tranquility is actually a better approach for elderly people right like you can be tranquil you might not be like experiencing ecstasy anymore uh, but you might very well be at peace and yeah. I think for a lot of people, there is a lot to be said about that. So I just wanted to pick up like the example he uses about his own mother. So he said that like while he was writing the book, uh, his 88-year-old mother had a stroke uh, and he, he thought it was best to send her to a nursing home. And that she, because of the stroke, was una unable to kind of eat, uh, like so swallow things. Uh, and so he, she couldn't really eat like regular foods and even water had to be thickened before she could swallow it mm -hmm. um so so she couldn't even have like regular water anymore um and he found himself using stoicism as a way uh like not in an academic fashion but he found himself saying a lot of stoic things to her to kind of help her along um so, so he even quoted marcus aurelius saying that uh, life is more like wrestling than dancing mm -hmm. and that like it's it is a struggle and that 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 doesn't make necessarily make it unworthy to try and want to, to live. Uh, he encourages her to like do negative visualization and say that like, okay, so, you know, while, while you might have, uh, you've had a stroke and you're finding these things difficult, like at least you still have these things uh, and kind of encourage her to think about all the things she did have rather than the things she had lost, uh, which I think is quite important. And then it also talks about the fact that when she was like constantly pleading him to bring some proper water, like he couldn't do that. So he asked the nurse, like, what can we give her? And she said, like, well, we can give you an ice cube uh, and that like you can suck on the ice cube and then that will like, you'll get the sensation of water as it melts in your mouth. Mm. And like she took immense pleasure in this sensation. And you th just think like how any any uh, like, sort of person in their like younger life, if you gave them an ice cube, will take very little great satisfaction from it. But if you focus in the stoic way of thinking, uh, like suddenly the ice cube can be something of great importance. And it's mm. so simple. Uh, yet this this elderly woman like gained a lot of positivity out of these very small things. So I think in that sense, yeah, there, there is that importance that when you if you if you experience some sort of paralysis or stroke or anything like that, where your physical body takes a real serious turn and that you have to adapt your lifestyle, that stoicism might be a almost like a practical, I think people might end up just being stoic almost as just a way of naturally coping with what's ahead of them. I think a mm. lot of people find that. And even if that doesn't happen to you and you're in old age, like, as you said, Ollie, like a lot of the ways in which you can live change. And if you've prepared yourself for that throughout your life, that's great. If you spent your entire life kind of looking at short-term pleasures, wasting all your money, perhaps even making your body really unfit, that when you get to old age, you don't have the money to support you and your body is even worse than it, or it would have been otherwise. And then you are struggling even more and you might not just have the, the sort of mental strength, as it were, to, mm. to sort of make the best out of it. With this in mind, Epictetus, Marcus Aurelius, uh, William Irvine, uh, Massimo Piglucci, they all say something similar in that if you're going to be a Stoic, you can expect to be mocked. Um, there's also lots of stuff about how to deal with insults with humor, which we've kind of touched on. But they, uh, an interesting part which William Irvine talks about is perhaps we should engage in stealth or secret stoicism. So if you're motivated to adopt stoicism following uh, exploration of it, um, I think I'd follow the advice of these experts and say it's probably not best if you start walking around telling everybody you're a stoic. But try some of these techniques in your own mind and see if you can alleviate yourself from some of the suffering in the world on that cheery note should we engage in a game of mystery philosopher sure yes that's, that's the gift that keeps on giving isn't it that gets <laughs> us off the cycle the mystery philosopher well last time andrew got the point for the daniel dennett guess well done andrew are you still riding that wave of heaven mystic pleasure <laughs> in fact yes the stoics were wrong jack <laughs> <laughs> Ollie, I assume you went back to your head on accept point after that misery was just inflicted on you. Literally it. haven't thought about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> the Stoics are right. I'm so confused. Here's your quote. We cannot appeal to nature, subjectivism, or cultural relativism to justify objectification of other people or ourselves. We must continuously aim towards freedom, even if we are limited in our knowledge of where it might take us. I'm going to go with Jean-Paul Sartre. Oh, it's not Jean-Paul Sartre, no. Andrew? It's Simone de Beauvoir, then. It's kind of like Simone de Beauvoir, but they're not her words. 
Well, then I guess we'll yeah, not wait Simone the next <laughs> Yeah, sure. We'll wait until the next episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought you'd have a second guess. I forgot the no, rules no, for a second. I'm not allowed a second guess, Jack. Not without breaking attitude. the sacred rules of mystery philosophy. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Excellent. That was great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>